Now this evening, as I've mentioned, we're following up on just a part of what we looked at this morning. Remember, Jesus told the Jewish leaders uh, where I am going, and he was going to the Father. He says, you cannot come. Uh, basically, that was an indictment against them that they would not be able to go to heaven because they had crossed the line. Now, in that passage as well, Jesus said, I'm only going to be with you for a little while longer. And the reason why he was going to be there a little while longer was because there was still something he had to do, still some work he had to complete in order to bring those who would trust him into heaven. Now, that was just part of what Jesus does or what he, is, what he has done. Uh, this evening, we're going to, to look at what he did in that little time that was remaining. And we're also going to consider what he continues to do in order that you and I might eventually be with him in heaven. Jesus said that he has prepared a place for us in heaven. Uh, and the way that he has done that is through his past work and through his continuing work. So let's read a, a passage this evening that has to do with that continuing work that will keep us in God's grace. And part of this is what we look at this morning. What I'd like to do is read Romans 8. Verses 28 through 39. Paul writes, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And if that promise is true, which it is, we know that God will cause all things to work together for our good. To those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now this morning, remember, we saw Jesus telling the Jewish leaders that he would be with them for only a little while longer and then he was going to go to the Father. Uh, the Feast of Booths was the last of those feasts that he would celebrate on earth. And it was only six months away from the Passover where he would lay down his life. Now we also saw him tell them, as I've already mentioned, that they would not be able to come not only because they didn't believe in him. I mean, obviously, everyone who was unsaved doesn't believe in him. They went further than that. It was because they hated him and they wanted to kill him, even though they knew that he was the Messiah. They had crossed the line, and God was giving them up once and for all. Now, not all of the Jewish leaders, but these that Jesus was referring to. But just because they couldn't go doesn't mean that no one could. Uh, the reason why Jesus was going to the Father was that he might uh, secure a place in heaven for everyone who would trust him. 
for everyone who would receive him, for everyone who would love him and follow him and serve him. That he was going to prepare a place for you if you are trusting him this evening, if you've received him, if you're also following him, loving him, and serving him. Now what I'd like for us to think about uh, for a few minutes this evening is what Jesus has done. And especially what he continues to do in heaven so that he eventually can bring you to where he is, that you might be with him forever. Thankfully, those words that Jesus spoke to the Jewish leaders are not the words that he speaks to us. Through the gospel, he speaks peace to us. He speaks comfort. Now, what I want us to do is look at, at five things. First of all, Jesus had to complete his work here in order to bring you to heaven. Uh, Jesus had to ascend into heaven to bring you there. He had to be crowned, he had to be glorified, he had to be invested with power and authority in order to bring you to heaven. That he has to continually intercede for you to bring you to heaven. And that he needs to continue to reveal his will to you by his word and his spirit to bring you to heaven. So first of all, Jesus had to complete his work here on earth that he might bring you to heaven. And that's what he had yet to do during this little while that he was still going to be, as it were, with the Jews to finish what it is the Father had given him to do. Uh, what were those things? Well, there was more signs that needed to be performed that he might demonstrate that he is the Messiah. There was more instruction that he had to give. He had to finish preparing his disciples to take over the work so that they might begin the process of reaching out to all those whom the Father has given to his Son. And then, of course, there was the matter of the atonement. If God was going to show mercy to you, if you were going to escape the punishment that was yours, that was due to you for your sins, there was a payment that had to be made. God's justice had to be satisfied. God can't just overlook sin. He can't just say one day I'm just going to forgive everyone and not have a payment that's going to satisfy his justice because his justice has been violated by us. It's been violated by everyone in the world. And if God is going to show mercy, that justice must be propitiated, must be satisfied. A payment has to be made. And so Jesus willingly made that payment. If you're trusting Jesus, if you really are loving him, serving him, following him, your sins were laid on him on the cross and Jesus suffered and he died in your place. That's what we're reminded of every Lord's Day when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Jesus had to rise again from the dead. I mean, the Father not only made the payment that was necessary in order to show mercy, but he wanted to make sure that that payment that, that we knew that his payment was actually accepted. He wanted to make sure that we knew that his son rose from the dead, that we might know that our sins have been forgiven, that payment has been made, that payment has been accepted, and we are forgiven. There were also things Jesus needed to teach his disciples that, that either he hadn't taught them before, or maybe they didn't understand the first time around. You know, Jesus had to repeat things several times, and we have to hear things several times before we you know, can remember them. Or maybe things that they couldn't understand until Jesus had died and rose again. And so Jesus stayed on earth for another 40 days. And he taught them about the things of the kingdom of heaven. Now what were those things? Well, we don't know exactly, but I would say undoubtedly they were incorporated into their writings so that you would know what you needed to know in order to be saved. Jesus had to complete these things. Well, second, Jesus had to ascend in order to bring you into heaven. Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, verses 1 through 3, as we read this morning, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
Jesus needed to ascend in order to prepare a place. Now, that's one of the reasons, but another reason is this. Jesus had to ascend so that we might eventually ascend. Everything that Jesus did in his, in his life, he did for us. You know, we talk about uh, the atonement, and we call it the vicarious atonement of Jesus Christ. And what we mean by that is that he took our place in God's judgment on the cross. Uh, the cross, uh, well, I should say, you know, he, he took our place. He was our vicar, you might say, and he suffered and died in our place. But when, one thing we need to realize is the cross was not the only time that Jesus took our place. Jesus took our place in everything that he did. I can't help but think when I think about the vicar, you know, this idea of vicariousness uh, of the Pope. As you know, the Pope is, I would say, arrogant, arrogant enough to believe and to call himself the vicar of Christ, the one who actually takes his place as the head of his church on earth. But you see, he isn't the vicar of Christ. Christ is actually our vicar when you stop and think about it. He is the one who took our place. He's the one who obeyed in our place. He became a man so that he might obey God's law, so that we might have a righteousness that was perfect, so that we could enter heaven. Uh, he died in our place, as we just saw, the vicarious atonement. Jesus went to the cross. Our sins were laid on him. He suffered and died in our place. He rose again in our place because he rose from the dead. We also will rise. And he ascended into heaven in our place. He did all these things for us so that one day we could be with him if we would simply trust him. And one day we will be with him, either at our death when he comes for us or at his second coming, whichever comes first. And personally, I think it will be at our death, because I think the second coming is still many years off, but if it isn't, it doesn't matter. One way or the other, Jesus will come for us. Our arrival in heaven is so certain through the work that Jesus Christ did that Paul speaks about it as something that has already happened. It's already a done deal. As a matter of fact, we are already, because we are united to Christ and because he accomplished all these things for us, we are pictured by Paul as being already in heaven. As a matter of fact, the passage I read in Romans chapter 8 uh, includes something of that as well because Paul says we are already glorified. If, if the Lord has foreknown us, if he's foreloved us, if he's predestined us, if he's called us, then we will also be glorified if we have been justified by the grace of Christ. But he writes in Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. That's the, the raising to life. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul writes this to the Ephesians, and he includes himself in it. And he says he has raised us up with him, and he has seated us with him in the heavenly places. That's past tense. Certainly the, the, the raising to life is past tense, but raised up to heaven with him, seated, uh, seated us with him in heaven. He even refers to that as something that is past tense. And the reason why he does that is because it is so certain to take place that it's a done deal. Also, we are united to Jesus Christ if we are trusting him. And if we are, then because he is seated in heaven, we also are seated with him in heaven. Jesus ascended so that we might one day be with him. Now, thirdly, Jesus had to be crowned with authority in order to bring you to heaven. This was certainly part of the, of the reward, part of the glory which the Father promised Jesus for this work that he would do of redeeming us. 
uh, David wrote in our call to worship in Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. I want you to see that this is the reward, part of the reward anyway, that the father has for his son. He says to his son, sit at my right hand, this place of honor, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, until I subdue them all under you. But not only is this a reward that the father gave to his son, this is also part of the Lord's work to save us. All authority, remember Jesus said in the Great Commission, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Jesus has the reins of the world. He has absolute control. And he uses that control not only to ensure our safety, but also to make sure that his kingdom advances. By the way, now we're moving into some of what we call that work of Christ in his three offices, that work of prophet, priest, and king. This is his work as king. The Westminster Shorter Catechism asks this question, how does Christ execute the office of a king? And what they mean by execute there is how does he carry it out? How does he perform it? And the answers or the Westminster Assembly answers the question this way, Christ performs, he executes, performs the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. Now it's interesting that as a king, the first thing Jesus has to do is he has to subdue us because we were his enemies. That's the way we came into the world just like the rest of the world. If I had read from Ephesians 2 in, the, in verse 1, we would see that we used to walk according to the prince of the power of the air. We were children of wrath, even as the rest. We came into this world hating God and hating his son. So if he was going to rule over us, if we were going to be his subjects, he first of all had to overcome our hearts. He had to subdue us which is what he did as king. You know, his first act as king when he was crowned on that day when he ascended into heaven was to send his Holy Spirit and to empower his people. And he continues to send his spirit when and where he wills to sovereignly to subdue hearts. That's what he did with us. He sent his spirit to put his law within our minds and to write them upon our hearts so that by the power of his Holy Spirit, we would willingly bow our knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and we would obey him, we would follow him, we would do that out of love. We would serve him. Again, that is the mark that he has saved us is that he has overcome our hatred against him. He has overcome our will and our selfishness and he has put our feet on the path of righteousness because we love him. Now to keep us as his subjects, he had to make sure that nobody would take us away from him. So he also had to have the ability to restrain and conquer his enemies, which are our enemies, so they ultimately could not destroy us. And so he has been given that promise of the Father that all of his enemies will be subdued under his feet. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 25, for he must reign until he, that is the Father, has put all his enemies under his feet. Again, that's a very important verse when it comes to when Jesus Christ is coming, but he's not going to come until all of his enemies are subdued because... Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy that will be subdued is death. And he will subdue that when he comes again to translate the living and to raise the dead and to gather them all together for the judgment. But Jesus has the power and he has the promise to restrain and conquer all of his enemies, which are our enemies. And there is nothing, as we saw this morning, 
that can possibly take us away from him. This is the power and the authority he has as our king. Now, he not only has power over all of our enemies, but he has power over everything, absolutely everything. As he says again in the Great Commission, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Jesus is in control over everything that has happened in the world and in our lives, everything that is happening in the world and in our lives, everything that ever will happen in the world and in our lives. He's in control of the weather. He's in control of the things that happen in this world, which we consider to be natural catastrophes, disasters, whatever. He's in control. Jesus is in control of everything. And because he is in control, he can promise us that he can actually carry it out. What we read earlier, that everything that goes, that happens in our lives, everything that takes place is going to turn out all right for us. It's going to work together for our good. Again, Paul writes in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Whatever it is you might be going through now, and all of us are going through things that, at least humanly speaking, we would say, you know, I'd rather not have to go through these things because they're difficult. I'd rather that everything be easy. I'd rather that everything just flow the right direction. But you know as a Christian, that's not going to happen. I think it was, forget now which one of the missionaries we looked at uh, said this. It may have been George Mueller who said that God gives us faith for the purpose of testing it. Uh, he, he tests it so that it might be purified, so that it might grow. Uh, we have to expect that this is what the Lord is going to do, but we have the promise that no matter what it is, that he is going to put us through to try our faith, that it is going to work together for our good. It's going to strengthen our faith, purify our faith, cause us to grow more into the image of Christ. You know, the Lord knows exactly where to put his finger on our lives, exactly what to bring into our lives to bring about what it is that he knows that we need, that push we need to move forward and to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord not only has this this has been given this, this power and this control and this authority as king in order to bring you to heaven, he also needs to intercede, as we've already seen, to bring you to heaven. Uh, this is Jesus' priestly work that he continues. Again, the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks, and I just replaced that word execute with the word perform, how does Christ perform the office of a priest and answers in this way? Christ performs the office of a priest in his once offering up of himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice, and reconcile us to God and in making continual intercession for us. Now, I've already told you that Jesus did what he needed to do on earth in order to save us, in order to bring us to heaven. Uh, he made this atonement, as, as we've seen. But before he did, he also prayed for us. That was a part of his priestly work on earth. He prayed for us. We saw that this morning in our reading of John chapter 17, as we were preparing to come to the Lord's table, we call that Jesus' high priestly prayer. And that prayer was not only for his disciples who were there on earth at that time, but it was also for those who would believe through their word. That includes us. And Jesus gave himself up as an offering for our sins, as we've just read, once for all. We read in Hebrews 7, verses 26 and 27. The author to the Hebrews writes, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separate, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. Jesus made that offering. It was a one-time offering. It was all that was needed. 
now that he is in heaven, he continues to do what needs to be done in heaven to keep us in the grace of God. He continues to pray. Now, we know that the Lord originally gave priests in the Old Testament, and actually there were family priests before that, that they might mediate, that they might stand between God and his people to reconcile them to him. When his people sinned, they would bring a sacrifice to the priests. The priest would offer it. The priest would pray on their behalf, and they would be forgiven. That's how the Lord dealt with it. Well, when our Lord Jesus Christ came, he did what the priests had to do. He offered a sacrifice, and he prayed to reconcile us to God. But now that he is in heaven, and because we still continue to sin, we still need a priest, and Jesus is our priest. He's already offered the perfect once-for-all sacrifice, so he doesn't need to do that again, but he does still need to pray. And that's what he does, so that our sins will not ultimately separate us from God, but we will remain reconciled if we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 7, verse 25. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Uh, Jesus' intercession is the reason why, if you have trusted Jesus Christ, you will make it to heaven because he prays for you. Now, finally, there's one more thing Jesus needs to do, and that is he needs to continue to guide you by his word and his spirit, as it were, to show you the way to heaven. And this is his work as prophet. Westminster Shorter Catechism finally asks this question, how does Christ perform the office of a prophet? And answers, Christ performs the office of a prophet in revealing to us by his word and spirit the will of God for our salvation. Jesus was doing this before he came into the world. He is the one, it was his spirit who, who gave the Old Testament scriptures, which were pointing forward to him. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 11, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Jesus was acting as prophet even in the Old Testament by his Spirit because his Spirit was the Spirit of the prophets. Jesus was revealing his will as our prophet while he was on earth. In John 15, 15, Jesus says to his disciples, No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus was declaring to them the will of God for their salvation and those things they wrote down so that we would know. He continued to act as a prophet through his apostles. After he was taken up into heaven, he continued to give them his spirit so that they, may write, they might write down the New Testament scriptures so that through them we might know the will of God for our salvation. And Jesus continues to do this work as prophet now from heaven by sending his spirit who illumines his word so that when you read it, you see it for what it is. You see that it is the Word of God, the Word that He gave, so that you will see its beauty and you'll, you'll love this Word and desire to know it and to obey it. This is Christ's work as prophet. He not only reveals the Word of God to you, but He shows it to you in such a way that you will love it and want to submit to it. And, of course, our Lord continues to exercise this office by appointing in His church pastors and teachers to explain the Bible, to apply the Bible from the pulpit in small groups and teaching and in private counseling. Now the point is Jesus has done everything that you need to get you into heaven. Jesus obeyed. Jesus died. Jesus rose again from the dead. Jesus ascended into heaven. 
Jesus was crowned with all power and authority over all things. Jesus intercedes, and Jesus continues to show you the way to get there through himself by following him. Now, the, the question we asked this morning was this, do you want to know that you're safe from ever committing the sin that we saw this morning, the sin that has no forgiveness, the unpardonable sin? Do you want to know that you're going to make it to heaven, that what Jesus did and continues to do is something that he did and is doing for you? Well, if you want to know that, we, we saw that you, you do need more than just believing the truth. You do need more than just this assent that the things that the Word of God says actually are true, that Jesus really did live, He really did do this work, and that those who trust Him really do go to heaven. It's not enough simply to believe those facts. There are things you must do. The Lord says you must stop doing the things that you know you are not to do the things he commands you not to do, the things that are sin. You have to be willing to turn from those things, not just knowing that that's true, not just agreeing that's what you need to do. You actually need to do it. You need to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, his righteousness, his death. You need to trust him with all your hearts to get you into heaven. You need to trust him alone, not your works, but in him alone. And... You must obey him in everything that he tells you to do. Again, not just stopping, stop doing what it is he commands you not to do, but you do need to do the things that he tells you in his word that you are to do. We all need to do that. We need to be obedient. That's what it means to love the Lord, obey him, follow him, serve him. We don't just do it the way we want to do it. We do it the way he tells us to do it. Now, if that's what you're doing, because that's what you want to do, because the Spirit of God is in you, because He's moving you to do these things, then you can know that Jesus, that what He did and what He continues to do, He is doing for you. You can know that you will arrive safely in heaven. But if you can't do them, if you don't have this love for His Word, this love for His law, if you're not following Him, if you're not troubled when you fail to obey Him, then you really need, do need to ask the question, am I the Lord's? Do I really belong to Him? Is Jesus really, has He really done all these things for me? Because the Bible does say that when we have trusted Jesus, the change that takes place in our lives is so remarkable. It's like the difference between a dead man and one who is alive. It's only that deadness and that Aliveness, as it were, has to do with the things of God, not physically, but spiritually. Before, I wanted nothing to do with God. I wanted nothing to do with anything but what was pleasing to me. I was seeking my own things, doing my own thing, wanting my own glory. But now I've set those things aside, and now I'm alive to Christ. Now I desire His glory. I want to do what He wants me to do. I want to follow Him. I want to serve Him. That is the difference between a person who is dead and a person who is alive. And unless you see the life of Christ in you, unless you see the Spirit of God acting in this way, having written this law upon your heart, giving you this desire, you really do need to question whether you are the Lord's because this promise, as we've seen, is for those who love Him and those who follow Him. And so if you don't belong to Jesus, again, I would encourage you this evening to come to Him. You need to understand Jesus stands ready to do all these things for you. He has already done everything that he has done for everyone who will turn from their sins and trust in him. He continues to do these things for all who will come to him, and he bids all to come. He will do these things for you if you will come to him. And so look to Jesus. I would again remind you of what we saw this morning with the thief on the cross. It's, it's not a difficult work. The Lord hasn't said, go climb Mount Everest, and then I'll let you into heaven. But like the thief on the cross, he just looked to Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. 
There's a remarkable contrast between what he said to that thief and what he said to those Pharisees. You cannot come where I am going, he said to those who had committed the unpardonable sin. And if you're not trusting Jesus, you're in danger of that sin. But he said to the thief on the cross who simply looked to him in faith, today you will be with me in paradise. And Jesus will say that to you, not that today you'll be in paradise, but one day you'll be in paradise, if you will simply look to him in faith and say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. If you just simply trust him, he will save you. Everything that he has done will be applied to you. Everything that he's doing, he will do for you, and he will make sure that you arrive in heaven. So if you haven't trusted Jesus, look to him now. Come to him now and be saved. Let's bow and let's ask the Lord again to apply his word to our lives.